everybody. Welcome to the May 2024 meeting of the Metropolitan Study Group of the SRIA. Thanks very much for being here. And um, I'd like to make a very special um, uh, yeah. warm welcome to everybody at the Atlantis Bookstore in London, and in particular to our uh, speaker today, um, Geraldine Beskin, who is the owner of the Atlantis Bookstore. Geraldine, it's lovely to see you. It's been a few years since I saw you Indeed. in person. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Yes. Um, I'm just going to pin your image to the, the screen for the purposes of the recording. So if you could just, just hold on for one moment while I do that, yes. please. Okay, uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Geraldine Beskin. Over to you, Geraldine, all yours. Right. Well, it gives me great pleasure to be invited again to talk for the SRIA. I had the enormous honour of talking about Frederick Copley for you uh, last year, maybe. Yeah. And I, to, to realise I would be told I was the first woman ever to do it in 156 years was really quite something. So I'm glad to see you've all mended your ways and you're yeah. a lovely bunch. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased to have you here. So the shop is in um, my co-owner's da and daughter's at Barley Beskin's hands this afternoon. And I've got the easy job. I'm sitting down and talking, which is <laughs> rather what I like to do. So the women of Golden Dawn, and they're all very dear to our hearts. They were pioneering. The Golden Dawn was a pioneering organisation in so many ways because they blew the dust off um, sort of the medieval magics and things. And they took it away from being mysticism, which had been the great strength of the Theosophical Society. And they made it dynamic again. And if it hadn't been for the Masons who were involved, it wouldn't have had the structure that it had. They were used to rituals. They, they were used to a beginning, a middle and an end. They were used to the symbolism of things. And they really made a, a very worthwhile organisation, which is still going in many iterations around the world. Um, so I'll concentrate on the women because they were one of the great dynamic things about it was that men worked as equals as men, which in, even in late Victorian times was relatively un, un, unusual. But in 1865, 160 years ago, Elizabeth Sewell, who was a schoolmistress, wrote, girls are to dwell in quiet homes amongst a few friends, to exercise a noiseless influence, to be submissive and retiring, to be guarded from over fatigue, subject to restrictions, seldom trusted away from home, simply because if she's not so guarded, she will probably develop some disease. Wow. Any strain upon a girl's intellect is to be dreaded, and any attempt to bring women into competition with men can scarcely escape failure. <laughs> she was a woman of power. <laughs> you know? 20 years later, when the, the babies that were born that we're talking about, um, uh, that when Miss Sue was in charge, had become they'd become the new woman. They'd walked straight past her. Thank you very much. And she went to university, she went to the gym, she sometimes smoked, she sometimes smoked in public, they rode bicycles. Um, they were um, a great worry to people, though, still, because another lovely quote is that women had come to be seen as monstrous goddesses of degeneration, an evil creature who lorded it over all the horrifically horned beasts which populated man's sexual nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Here now. <laughs> we, we walk amongst you, Alison. Yeah, don't that's worry. That's your nightmare. Yes. <laughs> so 15 years later, by 1900, the three quarters of the women over the age of 15 were employed. A third of the women were unmarried, with various wars raging in the British Empire being a great contributory factor. Many were effectively abandoned by their handsome soldier boy husbands as we ruled a quarter of the surface of the earth and they were far, far from home and their women had to feed the babies somehow. So life was tough, you know, um, and those that were married lost all access to their own money, land and possessions when they, because when they married, they automatically belonged to their husbands. If their husbands went off them, they just had to say that the woman was crazy. And she would then be put in and then be put in a lunatic asylum and she'd never see her children, her family or her money ever again. It, you know, so quite 
you know, rough stuff. These women were not settling for any of that. Um, <laughs> women that, that joined the Golden Dawn put any idea of respectability away, really, because they were quite out there. They were ad adventuresome. They, it was a, a social, there was a social evolution, if not revolution, going on. And they were very, very, very much a part of that. And they were clever and they were brave. And I think that having made the dramatic step, they felt very empowered by their actions. And they also found that they weren't alone. They, you know, by going to art school, things like that, they found that they weren't just thinking revolutionary thoughts. They, 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 it was a collaboration going on about those things. Um, it was enormously personally rewarding. It was hard work. And they met very interesting people that made it a very attractive package. These women were middle class. They were educated. Um, some of them had a bit of money. Um, and one of them had a lot of money, in fact. And she's insinuated herself into this or into this talk, so um, uh, which, which is fine by me. They weren't working in the mills in Manchester. They weren't having hard lives. But what they were was suffragists and suffragettes as well. They very much believed in the emancipation of women and fought for it. They used their various skills artistically, creatively on the stage to put that agenda forward. Um, so one of them, Florence Farr, was an actress here in the West End, and she was um she was in Ibsen's Rolmachon, which is where all his plays are about women. In, who come across as incredibly selfish these days, but they were making up their own minds about things and they weren't settling for bad marriages or being swindled out of the family money or whatever it was. And he was um, so dramatic that he, he, he was, it was a real revolution in the theatre to go and be a part of it. But she made her, Florence Farm made her name really by working with him and she was her de Gabler as well. Um, and he shows that women are most, degraded through serving the imagination and stimulating the genius of men at the cost of their own. He wanted them to liberate themselves, but emancipation spells crisis, and he wanted women to search for their own spiritual purpose in this mechanistic world, um, which is a sort of quote. I copied that out of a book. I couldn't come up with a sentence like that myself. I must admit. Um, these women of the Golden Dawn lived as priestesses from the day of their initiation until their deaths. They, these were bright ladies, and as I say, if it hadn't been worth it or if it hadn't true, suited them, they, they would have just walked away and undone, undone all the magical ties and lived a whole other life, but they didn't. Um, and the same went for the men they were involved with. So initiation opens the psychic centres. Evocation brings you in contact with particular forces. Invocation invites the god in in order to partake of that consciousness. And Mina Mathers, of whom I'll speak more later, said, woman is the magician born by nature by reason of her natural sensibility and of her instinctive sympathy with such subtle energies as these intelligent inhabitants of the air, the earth, fire and water. <laughs> so scrying is sinking into the murky depths of one's own unconscious. Well, tell that to Frederick Ockley, actually. Um, and, and, it, and so said a magician who was claiming it had no spiritual value and could be an obstruction to the magical path. On one level, I agree with him, but on another, it completely ignores the fantastic wealth of verifiable material that you can bring through and how useful a lot of that is. And it misses the point entirely. And when you think of the work of people like Austin Spare, of Hilmar F. Klimt, you know, the, the, the theosophist who was considered man, but is now a poster girl for, you know, esoteric women artists. It's it's just quite fantastic. This communication with Denzians of other worlds is a very important thing to be able to do. So let's go. This is Madame Blavatsky. And everything starts with her. And she was Russian royalty on her on her mother's side, married at 17 to a 40 year old cavalry officer, got bored with him and said, well, I'm not going home anymore either, actually. So they gave her a, a, some money that, and she traveled the world. Reputedly, she went to Tibet when you couldn't get there. And she um, was shipwrecked a couple of times. She smoked dope. She swore a bit and 
Um, she fought with Garibaldi in Italy and she had the scars on her legs to prove it. She actually fought with Garibaldi. She didn't just support him. She was there in the thick of it. Geraldine, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could yeah. I ask you, please? You, it seems like you have a presentation there with images, but we can't see them. Is there any oh. way to share those images? Yeah. Shall I give you uh, screen yeah. sharing? One yes. second, yeah. please. Sorry, sorry, Shane. Hold on. That's okay. I wasn't aware that we were doing that. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Sure. Hold on one moment. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Sorry okay. for the interruption, but that's great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Good. And the only other thing, well, a couple of things I was going to say about her was that her governess, who taught her English, um, came from up north, so she wouldn't speak English in England because she sounded like someone from Coronation Street. <laughs> uh, but she set up the Theosophical Society in New York in 1875, and through one of their members dying who wanted to be cremated, she brought cremation to the West because there was nowhere to get them cremated at the time. And then New York being such a melting pot, lots of cultures said, we'd like to be cremated too, please. And it started that whole trend. So, um, but say she, she was absolutely fabulous in lots of ways. Men and women joined. They used to go to their meetings in evening dress with long white gloves and, you know, their diamonds and things like that. All very genteel, very civilized. After a few years, Masons had joined and they wanted a bit of ritual. They wanted a bit more substance rather than this mystical stuff she was talking about. And so when the Golden Dawn happened, they said that they were they were going to join. And she said, you can't belong to both organisations because she saw it as a threat to her. So some Masons from Preston came down and said, look, love, if, you, if you, we can't belong to both, we'll take your membership with us. So she very sensibly said, well, of course you can belong organizations that's not a problem at all so um but so so that's where a lot of these people met and um westcott and woodman and all that early guard would have been very well aware of the um the, the theosophical society that's where it grew out of this is a drawing by mina mathers of her mother and very little remains of mina mathers stuff we have the um the portrait of mcgregor mathers upstairs in the shop I have another one at home that belongs to somebody and I keep meaning to bring it back, but I never quite managed it. I took it home for COVID and it's, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll come back soon. But this is her. And she was proper bohemian, basically. And she'd cut her hair and she was a, a fascinating woman. She was born on the 28th of February, 1865, as the fourth of seven children of a Yorkshire doctor's daughter and a Polish Jewish pianist composer of operas who worked with Chopin and was sometimes successful and he was always temperamental. So she spent the first few years in Paris where they had wandered around Europe slightly. And then when they were nine, if she was nine, they came to London and settled in Bedford Park. And the whole development of Bedford Park is a whole other day long thing. But um, the Golden Dawn people and their families and extended families lived there. It, it was just simply stunning. So she was at the Slade, which had only allowed uh, art school, which had only allowed women in a few years beforehand. And that's where she met Annie Horneman. And they had one of those sort of young women's passions for each other they had a passion for each other and they swore undying friendship and they were never going to marry and all that sort of stuff and it soon became apparent that Mina was a, a better artist and then he accepted that she wasn't as good as she wanted to be as an artist as well really um her brother Mina's brother Henri Bergson was the philosopher and he lived he uh, won a Nobel Prize and he was also the first president of the um Society for Psychical Research, a very interesting man. And um, in Europe, he's, you know, understood and accepted. Over here, not so, but he really deserves being read. He's interesting. She looked like a, whip, a, chip, a witch, a gypsy, a priestess of Isis, an Egyptian priestess. She invented graphomania, which is where you take a, a line for a walk. She invented collage 10 years before Max Dernst claimed it. Um, she was really forward thinking. 
This is her um, when they were in um, Paris. At, I can't remember, 1901, 1904, something like that. A uh, big uh, exposition they had going there. And they put on Egyptian rites and she painted the backgrounds and she, the people fainted when the figures that they thought were absolutely static Egyptian uh, gods moved. They, she brought them to life and they just absolutely amazed people. This is the man she married, Samuel Mathers, and he was super fit. He would box and he would fence daily. And she, they met in the li in the library, of the, in the British Library at the top of the street here, uh, along with everybody else, really. And, you know, it had Karl Marx and everybody sitting there at various times, Karl Marx, Dickens and McGregor Mathers. You know, <laughs> what, a, what a cue for the tea that would have been, yeah. So, um, but he, he was very clever. He didn't, he didn't have any sort of background that was worth talking about, but he was a deeply passionate, very clever man. But the British, of course, being class-based, looked down on him rather and appreciated what he was good at, but just didn't really like inviting him around for tea. Mina said he's absolutely fascinating, but I'm not going to marry him. And then, of course, she did. Um, Annie resented that to some extent. But so you then have Woodman, the North London, Woodman, the um, agriculturalist. You have um, Wim Westcott, the North London coroner, and Mathers. And they decide to set up a magical order because they'd found some cipher manuscripts and they were going to work them. So they set it up. And then the first person they initiated was Mina Mathers on her 23rd birthday. Now, they didn't know if she would fly to the moon, be insane by the end of the ritual, a puddle of green slime on the floor. They had no idea of the potency of what they were actually saying and doing at that stage. And then they realized that it would seem to be okay. And so and they so they progressed with um with the cipher cipher manuscripts and putting in more and more bits. What's interesting about cipher manuscripts is as well as all the whole, you know, are they real, are they not? The tarot was the first thing that people were taught. This was the outer order. Um, and uh, from Zelator onwards, you were taught things like the tarot. And so that by the time you went into the second order. Everybody knew what everybody meant by what was said. You know, red means blah 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 blah. You know, you, you it, it, so that you you were you had your basic training in the outer order, of the first order, and then the second order didn't exist at the time. Mina Mathers wrote all that up. So she she, she was incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, so. There was a um, let's say she she'd married badly. Now they had no money, and so they then uh, went off to Pat. They set up the Golden Dawn. All was going very well, really. Uh, and then he went off to Paris to study more, and because it was cheaper, Mina asked Annie Horneman, who had loads of money, whether she would help them because she'd been first of all she'd found a job for them at the Horniman Museum. And the guy with the moustache is believed to be McGregor Mothers. The rest of them are the Horniman family. And that's uh, the beautiful museum that they built in South East London, which is England's only Art Nouveau museum. And that's because her father had been a great nat uh, natural history buff and just bought everything because he could afford it. When her, when Annie Horniman's grandfather died in 1875, 1873, he'd gone from having a corner shop to owning the biggest tea company in the world, and he left a personal fortune of £25 million in today's money. And he, they were Quakers, and he was a very fair-minded man, and in his will, it says that if his son predeceased him, then his grandson and his granddaughter, Annie, would inherit the money in equal shares, which was, again, quite a radical thing. Her father had, wasn't a Quaker. He was a very liberal-minded man. He was a liberal, liberal MP uh, for Falmouth. And um, she, he, 
he was very good with her. It was with Annie as well, but they. Um, <laughs> she was an awkward soul, and uh, really, but he, he, she, she had her own rooms in the house, so she could have her own friends there, and she was quite radical in lots and lots of ways. But she established the Matherses with three hundred pounds a year, which was a lot of money then. And they never had children. They always said that their marriage was non-consummated because they were devoted to the great work. You know, they couldn't afford to bring kids into their intellectual, magical world as, as much as anything else. It wasn't just the money. They were busy with other stuff. Um, and uh, there was a, eventually there was a big schism in the uh, Golden Dawn, which Alistair Crowley usually gets the um nagging for but it actually it was Berridge Dr Berridge was a sex pest and he um he was he caused a lot of, a lot of difficulties um you you then had um Florence Farr doing rituals where instead of evoking something into the temple they were invoking into themselves which was considered extraordinarily dangerous and it, it was all rather than Alan Bennett, people like that were involved with all of that. So it, it became quite a maelstrom. You then have Annie Horniman, who didn't make a move without consulting her astrology and her tarot. And she, if she took against you, and this was her modus operandi, really, she did it with the, her theatre work and all the rest of it. She took against you, she would hunt you down. You could not ever make amends as far as she was concerned. And she was running um, London and she kept saying to, you know, sort of snip, sniping at Mathers because they constantly needed more money. And um, it, was, it was, things were getting difficult to hear because she wasn't very good at man management. And um, so she, she just kept on and on and it, it, it fell apart. If you read the letters, she is the one. That, uh, she is the one who's saying, and he did this, and he did that, and then on the fourteenth inst, such and such happened. All the rest of it. Mothers, for a long time, has been said to be a madman who was drunk and all that. But his letters show a very even hand. He doesn't write in green ink and capital letters or anything like that. And he he's the man who's a day behind with the post, basically. He wasn't in the thick of it. And eventually he said, oi, you lot, stop it. This is my order, not yours. I'm running it. I'm the head of it. Do what I say. Just just backtrack. And Annie Horniman said, no, we're not going to. So he then had to expel her. And it all went on like that. He, Alistair Crowley was his great chum at the time, who'd been fast-tracked through everything because he was super bright. He went over to Paris and said, it's not fair, you know, they're, they're doing badly. So Mathers then famously put some dried peas into a sieve, named them and shook them about to, as a sort of a, a curse against the members. And then Crowley came back to get um, vital uh, papers and things like that for him. Crowley gets all the headlines for his role in that. But the mastermind really was Annie Horniman. I would develop that further on another occasion mm -hmm. okay but uh it, it's uh so and as i say we're, we're very pleased oh, what have i done alex what have i done oh, hold on i've confused everything bear with me there, there we are lovely yeah. so so very pleased to have that up in the shop it um was offered to ethel calhoun and Mrs. Thing rang her and said, do you want the portrait of Mathers or shall I put it on the bonfire with the other things? And so she said, no, 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 I'll have it because she was living in Cornwall. She felt that that would be safe from the Nazis and she lived with him until she died. And then, as I'm sure all of you have heard, it, it was then offered to me and it cost me many months mortgage money and a thumping great row with my husband, but I remain unrepentant. Yeah. I love him. I love him. Um, so uh, we're, as I say, we're very, very fortunate to have that. It's also extraordinarily difficult to photograph. Um, in bright daylight, it's very different. And you can see the jewels in the hilt of his sword and things like that. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a very fine thing indeed. 
And, you know, you can't blame her for blame people for wanting to get rid of it because one of the things I've brought in as a bit of a show and tell is a newspaper cutting from 1966 when what they thought was a witch's box was found on the beach near Brighton and it has Golden Dawn regalia in it. And it also lists all the bits and pieces and it was all magical stuff that they found in there. And there'd been a landslip in somebody's garden, it landed on the beach. And fortunately it was discovered as, you know, before it had been, uh, got to, too damaged by the water. And so we have the fire wand from that cache upstairs as well. Um, so, uh, so as I say, Mina Mathers stayed in, it, Mathers died in, Par in Paris in 1919. Nobody knows the actual date um, during the flu epidemic then. And he, um, then Mina Mathers lived over there. Eventually she came back to England and the Golden Dawn had moved on. She was just this alien old lady, really. You know, very tall, very elegant, dressed nicely, um, had all sort of voice with authority in it. But she was the old guard. They really weren't that interested in her. And um, she tried to establish herself as an artist over here, didn't particularly work. And so eventually she she stopped eating, which, you know, she she was knew she was dying, basically. And... Um, she she died in on the twenty fifth of uh, July nineteen twenty eight. But she was the greatest clairvoyant of the last century. I genuinely think. Um, and in the early years of the of the GD, uh, W. B. Yeats had shared many visions with Moyner and and Mathers. And um, it, you know he, he was saddened all those years later that they'd faded away from each other. Um, but Yeats being Yeats, he hadn't actually been useful when he could have been. Mm -hmm. This is Florence Farr, who was um, 1860 to 1917. And she was called Florence because her father was a great friend of Florence Nightingale. And it was to him, because he was a medical officer for his health, that she sent back all these statistics from the Crimea. And she didn't invent the pie chart, but it was the first popular use of the pie chart. And she had a nice, you know, respectable upbringing. And again, she was the Ibsen's actress and she, she was quite a gal. Um, she was the opposite to uh, uh, Mina Mathers and her um, withholding of herself, really. Her, uh, free, uh, Mina Mathers' motto basically means I will leave almost nothing behind. So sort of, I won't leave a foot, leave any more than the footsteps, sort of thing. And it's very hard to find things by her. She was very, you know, quite busy producing things in in her time. Um, w. B. Yeats, who was in the Golden Dawn as well, thought that she was a fascinating person. That her mind was like a game of spillikin, spillikins, a bundle of different coloured sticks all muddled together. You never, you never knew which one would next be pulled out. Um, the poet Ezra Pound said that one comes to you and takes away strange game, trophies fished up from some curious suggestions, facts that lead nowhere, a tale or two pregnant with mandrakes. <laughs> well, that's very <laughs> Ezra Pound rather than Flora Flower, I think, really. Um, George Bernard Shaw, whose hair and beard were bright red like a pillar box, apparently. <laughs> uh, he, he was um, a bit of a cuckoo in the nest. He liked a, He liked a married woman, he did. And he was, uh, you know, one of these very sexually active, sandal wearing vegetarians. <laughs> and uh, but through Annie Horniman, his first plays, Yeats' first plays, were put on at the Avenue Theatre in Northumberland Avenue, and they didn't know for ten years that she'd been the angel that had paid for all of that, and they got slated in turn. Florence wrote plays, and her plays used to outsell. And her books used to outsell Bernard Shaw by two to one. Uh, they've, uh, you know, some of them have been reprinted now. Um, and if, uh, she was, she had an affair with uh, Bernard Shaw, and he said that she had a tranquil beauty, an incomparable sense of rhythm, and a beautiful voice. He also said that home is a girl's prison and a woman's workhouse. Far was very sexually liberated, and said. 
I was brought up in a large family until I was 23 and I lived an orthodox married life for four years. So I've given home and the family as much trial as seemed necessary. Um, she thought sex was for diversion, for producing heirs and for hygienic exercise. <laughs> uh, and she was said to have had 14 lovers by the time she was 34. Um, he had, as I say, Shaw was very jealous of her in lots of ways, really. Um, that's her on stage. And I went to see Roger Mahone with um, Tom Burke and I can't remember the actress's name a couple of years ago. And, and she was wearing an O'Donnell dress, which she didn't know was exactly the colour that Florence Farr wore when she um, played her. So that was a rather a lovely touch. Um, and she was obsessed by Egypt and had um, her books on e a book on Egypt published two years before Sir Wallace Budge produced anything himself. Um, he lived in the house right next to the British Museum, the one on the left. It's yeah. got a, a blue plaque there now. And he used to just sort of stand around and feed the pigeons quite a lot of the time. And they didn't have meetings in, they didn't hold GD meetings in the library or in the museum, but they did meet each other in his office and things like that. But they didn't actually do their magic there. But she she was very important as as a, um, her Egyptian magic, her her book on um, more or less whatever will, every girl should know about life is so up to the minute now. It should be in every 14-year-old's locker. It's fantastic. It is really positive and it's not anti-man or anything at all like that. It's just saying, you know, trust yourself, be yourself. It, and the social sense that all these guys had was just fabulous, really. So for four years, she was married to another actor who was a no good boy -o, really. And eventually um, she and I think it was Ellen Terry organised for him to go to America and he then didn't come back. So she divorced him. Divorce was unusual in those days. It was expensive. It was difficult to prove. The um, It was quite something to do that. So her voice was her great beauty, the beautiful thing about her. Um, and she used to play the lyre that uh, Arnold Dolmetsch had built for her. He was one of these guys who would have a shave in the morning and have a full beard and moustache by five o'clock. He was just hairy. And he also was a sort of guy who would get divorced in the morning and marry again in the afternoon. But his great thing was the redevelopment of the English, um, early English music. And so the lyre was the important thing. Uh, but her voice, her cadence was just extraordinary and very, very elegant, very, very lovely. So she carried on with all this. She ran the, the um, after Annie, she ran um, the GD in London. And she was very much more liberal minded. Instead of people having to do written exams, she would say, just talk to me about it, tell me how it is. And, you know, things evolve. And Mathers had difficulty with that, I think, really, and especially with his militaristic attitude about things. Um, and so she was a great astrologer. She was a very good administrator. And um, she then spent her latter years in as a head of a, that's her, with her lyre, and she then spent her latter years as the headmistress of a girls' school in Ceylon. And um, she then got breast cancer and died over there, but sent a very lovely little uh, pen and ink drawing of herself with a, a leaf-shaped scar, having had her left boob chopped off. Um, George Bernard Shaw said she only went there because she was getting a bit old and her looks were fading. And But she'd been the only woman that he had wanted to get divorced so he could marry her. Mm. As I say, he far preferred an, a, a married woman. Instead of which, he married a nice drab lady who functioned for him and they lived in quite some austerity. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, so, so she she also was involved with the I Ching alchemy, Enochian, um, and she, uh, yeah, so I think that that's enough, really. And so she was the chief adept in the UK, um, because and it was known that West, Westcott had had to retire or resign 
because uh, it became known by his bosses that he wasn't a cor- you know he was the coroner and he was a magician. And their their attitude was, you're here to bury bodies, not to conjure them up, sort of thing. So that was it. So the next one gets ignored a bit as a golden dawner. Oh, this is little Cahoon who's jumped in. I don't quite know why or how. Um, oh, right. I'll go to little Cahoon then. So she was um, in, an Indian Army officer's daughter. She's... Um, quite a a hit with lots of people now. She wrote a very difficult, long alchemical novel uh, called called Goose of Hermogenes. She wrote a couple of other books about travel, uh, psychic travels in Ireland and things, and she drifted about. And she she went to Rodine and she... Uh, She was a surrealist, and her name is on the rise again. Uh, The the Tate have got quite a lot of her stuff, and it's coming out in dribs and drabs and dribs and drabs. And as you all know, esoteric women artists are a very hot ticket currently. Um, But she was there way ahead of other people. Um, And she was uh, there. She lived down in Paul. Uh, she didn't abandon her surrealist tendencies, and but she was thrown out of the surrealists because she was too bourgeois. Um, and she also used men as sexual objects rather than uh, the, 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 the woman being the sexual object to that extent, except when she was very bold about it. Um, now, is that a woman in the bath or is that a sea anemone and some rocks? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Is that a cave, or is it not? (laughs) (laughs) And when you think she was doing this, you know, in the thirties, forties, even the twenties, some of it, it was really quite something. And she wrote the only biography of Mathers that there's been so far. And it's it shows how guileless she was in some ways. It says, the very first line, I think, is almost as good as a Jane Austen line about husbands. But this one says, I was a schoolgirl sitting on a lavatory seat and leaning forward so as to see into the depth of an osier basket lined with newspapers because she'd found an article about Austin, uh, about Alistair Crowley and was intrigued. But anybody who starts a book saying they were sitting on a lavatory seat, you know they're not going to deliberately mislead you. Uh, You know, this was all pre-Google. She did mislead. She wasn't accurate in lots of ways, but uh, she, she, she's the only one. You know, somebody please do some work on McGregor Mathers. Get it out there. You know, it's uh, some of it is findable still. Um, so uh, say so she was she was at, uh, she wasn't at Rodine at all. She was at Cheltenham Ladies College, and then she went to the Slade as well. And she was recognised as an important original talent for her year for um altogether they think they knew that she would go far um she had a cousin Edward Garstin who suggested that she might like to join a marriageable group and so in those days you'd be invited round for tea and she duly went and then she didn't hear anything else and eventually she said to her cousin well you know and, he's, and he sort of shuffled about a bit and he said yeah they just sort of didn't like you you can't join no sorry about that and then years later she tried again and they came and went not quite us, because by then she'd done things like discover Kenneth Grant and joined the OTO. She was a druid for a number of years and she drifted in and out of groups. She wasn't really settled anywhere. She was a bit of a will o' the wisp woman to, to that extent. Um, and she she married a surrealist, but that ended in divorce. Um, and she's included because although she wasn't a member, she sort of hung around. Um, you know, with, with them um, and knew of them and had some, you know, uh, had some of his stuff. So the other woman I was going to talk about um, is Yates's wife, who was um, Georgina Hyde Lees. And I don't know why, that, no, that's the end. Right, okay. George Hyde Lees was considerably younger than Yeats, 
And she had a feckless artist drunkard as a father and spent a lot of her childhood in Europe as well. So she spoke Italian, she spoke French. She knew her way around the, uh, the alchemists. She knew a lot of Latin. She knew Greek. She was in the Golden Dawn and Yeats had an astrological imperative to get married before he was 50, which was the October that before October that year, because he would have lost his opportunity to get married in this lifetime otherwise. So his longtime love was Maud Gon, who was the embodiment of Ireland and all that was fabulous. And so she would never marry him. So he asked her daughter if she would marry him instead, which was supremely tacky. And she basically said, all right, no. Um, so he then married Georgie Hyde Lees, who wasn't this passive little soul at all. She was really a smart cookie, a well-educated, and knew a lot of magic, even though he'd, he'd been around for longer. And on their honeymoon down in Kent, she started doing some automatic writing. And I said this the other day to someone, I've never thrown a book across the room, but I nearly did in this case because there's a biography I was reading it. And it said, oh, yes, well, she was so much younger than him and he was so much more sexually experienced than her. And she was so shy about contraception and things. She just used the cover of automatic writing to sort of discuss sex, uh, discuss contraception. And actually, she was worth more than that. And she um, actually had four <laughs> controls that came through to them. And they used those four controls forensically for the next 40 years because Yates never left the Golden Dawn and neither did she. And the first one of the first messages they got through was the entity said, I have come to give you new metaphors for poetry. And with that, he began after an eight year drought as a poet, he then became the great modernist poet of the of the era. And I'll give the 20th century. He won a Nobel Prize for his for his work. He was um helped design everything from the Irish Free States coinage up and down the scale. He was absolutely fated. Georgie produced two kids, a boy and a girl, and she he bought a tower over in West Court in, in Sligo to a Ballylee Lee and for £35. And but it was her who arranged to have the bog drained, to have the big bridge rebuilt. She was pregnant and painting the outside window frames and things like that. She organized him and she was also his help meet. If she hadn't been a good, you know, um, good with the automatic writing, but got nothing through. Yates would have just faded and just been yet another Irishman who sort of blethered on about the old country and, you know, wanted to be recognised and was just a minor poet. So, I say she's a very, very important woman. And then um, she organised him, as I say, and put up with an enormous amount and because he was serially unfaithful to her. And she, for instance, Maud Gone was being hounded by the Irish for something. And so he, she'd lent them her house in Dublin. And so she knocked on the door and said, help, 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 let me in, let me in, let me in. Yates turns up at the door and says, no, terribly sorry, I can't, my wife's got a headache, slammed the door in her face, left her to the ravening mob. Mm -hmm. Yates was fabulous, but he was also absolutely disgraceful. Very, you know, I love him and hate him in equal measure, really. Um, but say Georgie Hydley's was his helpmeet through all of that. And even things like as he got older and his sexual powers waned, she had to sort of be with him while he had monkey glands injected into his testes to make him more virile. I mean, that man was desperate to keep on going, really. <laughs> anyway, when he died, it was in Paris. And <coughs> after the war, excuse me, the I oh, hold on, hold on. The Irish wanted his body back um, because he was such a famous son. And they didn't know which of two, uh, which grave he'd been buried in. And so they contacted the other family and said, well, our, our, they said, oh, well, we didn't know there was a problem, but our, our man was uh, six or four. And so the Yates family said, well, so was ours. And they said, oh, that doesn't help, does it? Um, 
And they went a bit to and fro, to and fro. And then they, they had to admit that Yates had been buried in a medical truss. And the other family had said, so was ours. <laughs> so nobody knows if the Irish have actually got the right body or not, which is quite funny. But so Georgie Hydley's was very, very, very important to it all. Um, so, oh, that's a, a portrait of the old Annie Horniman, who I have spoken about. That's her shortly before she died. Why she is important is because of all the golden dawners, she brought more joy to the world than any of the rest of them. She never married. She had bright ginger hair. When she was at Slade, she had a haircut. And Mina Mather said she looked like a ginger cat. Mm -hmm. So she became known as Tabby. And she used to purr when she was happy and she'd hiss if she didn't like you mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. But she was very serious about her magic. She never did anything without consulting the stars and primarily her tarot. Even the... Um, I don't know where it is at the moment. Hold on, hold on. Doesn't matter, I'll find it in a minute. Even the um, logo for her theatre work had a, 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 a magical glyph on it always. And she would give the explanation in the programmes of what those glyphs meant. You know, so as I say, I'll find that later. But she... Um, she went she went over to Ireland because she saw Yeats's genius and she paid for the Abbey Theatre to be started. And she loathed the Irish, but she thought that they're they were entitled to produce their own work to that extent. And again, this the, the rise of the women and all the rest. She loathed them, but she financed everything. Yates was loyal and disloyal to her. She'd made all her money in trade, so she looked down on the peasants. But Lady Gregory, who was Yates's other great friend, was Anglo-Irish landed gentry, and she looked down on Annie Horniman. And a part of Annie Horniman's whole tick through her life was that she was a liberal-minded woman from a liberal-minded family, and she didn't have a chip on her shoulder by because she was trade, because she knew she could buy and sell most of the people that she ever met. But she didn't like being looked down upon. And, and so she um, was very fair and encouraging and empowering to the poor working classes in that way. And so in, in Ireland, she set up the Abbey Theatre. Eventually, she realised that they would only want a nationalist theatre ever, so she and also Yates was just scandalously rude to her in public one day in the theatre and she walked away. She left him to it. She carried on financing it for a while, but she didn't want any more to do with it. So then she came to London, regrouped and thought, right, where is there a nice middle class uh, population that's used to going out? Manchester, Halle Orchestra mob. So she bought um, a building. She had it remodeled by Frank Matcham the great theatre designer. She put in, she got two vacuum cleaners, which were the height of high tech at the mm -hmm. time. She vacuumed up all the fleas. She put in half as many seats. She charged twice as much for them. And that was it. The Gaiety Theatre took off. And she started off with a play called um, When the Devil Was Ill, a comedy. And then she followed, followed it with um, something by Euripides. And the other people, the other guy she was very keen on was a German called Suderman, I think it was. But he was a German Ibsen to that extent. And it was all about the empowerment of women and how women must be given voices. She also did away with unreal um, sets and the frills and fancies and all of that. She liked people to wear plain dress as much as possible. So the words and the acting were the important thing. She wanted it to be as kitchen sink drama and as real as possible because all magical ritual is a psychodrama. All theatre is a psychodrama. And she wanted that magical aspect of theatre to weave in and out of it all. And it was a rip roaring success basically for a number of years. And, but her key thing with all of that was she said to the actors, I want to recruit locally. And I because forever, 
people who'd done their the actors had done their bit at their run of the play, then they packed everything into their wicker baskets and they got the Sunday night play, train to wherever the next place was. And she said, stay in Manchester. She invented the repertory theatre. Changed everything forever, globally. Absolutely fabulous. And it was all about ritual, which is why she was such a stickler and so difficult with people. And the, the GD rituals were done to a purpose and the plays were done to a purpose. They were done to educate. So she, she was quite, quite wonderful in lots of ways. Years later, when Lillian Bayliss, who was young at the time, her aunt Emma Cons said, right, you can, they're going to, they were going to turn a temperance um, hall into a, a theatre. They She put Lillian Bayliss in charge and she said, it's all right. I know I can do it because I know a woman did it once, Annie Horniman, and I know I can do it again. And she was in charge of the old pick. And then she invented the Royal Ballet. And then she invented the Royal Shakespeare Company. And so it went on. So the, these women were just utterly remarkable, I think, really. They, and they, 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 they kept their passion throughout their lives. And hold on, I've just got a bit to finish with. And so these um, women, there are direct magical ancestresses. Um, they live on in their writings and their art and because of their actions and the influence they exerted in the Golden Dawn. There are chemical pairings with, with men with great intellects that they at least rivaled. Their independence and willingness to lead dedicated magical lives are great legacies. And then it's up to us now to carry that torch on, magically or not, and to not let them down, I think is honestly so this is a small tribute to women of great stature and the women of the golden dawn thank you <laughs> geraldine that was absolutely wonderful thank you so much my pleasure uh, it was fascinating and uh, i think it's a, a wonderful thing that the focus of your presentation honours the women that have played such a, a radical and revolutionary part in the evolution of the Western mystery tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to open this up. I'm just going to shift it for the purpose of our recording to, um, let's see, we're going to go to the speaker view. Just Sorry, one Sheena, second, Sheena, please. Are we, Sheena, are we still sharing or not? Uh, well, yeah, do you want to? No. Yeah, okay, I'll stop that now then. And uh, I'm just going to go to the speaker view so that whoever is speaking, they will be on the screen. So I'd like to open this up now for questions uh, for Geraldine. And um, as usual, if you could please uh, make a little um, uh, raise your hand via the reactions in the bottom of the Zoom screen, that would be helpful for me to kind of mediate this. And uh, yeah, anybody with any particular questions or observations, comments, please, for Geraldine. Uh, let me know by placing, uh, raising your hand or just speak up if you would prefer to do so. Are there any people there at the Atlantis bookstore? Oh, actually, we have somebody, first of all, Lucy. Uh, over to you, please, Lucy. Hello, darling. Hello. <laughs> uh, Hello, Lucy. <laughs> Hello, love. How are you? I would have been with you, but I missed my train. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, something you and I haven't gone. Um, thank you for that, Geraldine. It was just wonderful. And uh, thank you all for having me. Um, it was really lovely, actually, that you acknowledged um, Annie Horniman's dad uh, as being MP for Penryn, Falmouth and Flushing, because I am, in fact, sitting in Falmouth as we speak. Um, and I think it's really fascinating that, <clears throat> again, one of the comments that you made was about the connections between um themselves but also their families how the families were um more liberal and i think it's really interesting that one of the stories that that i understand um within florence farr's life was that one of the reasons she ended up on the stage was because when her father died who and and he created the office of national statistics 
Um, and here's a pub quiz fact, anyone. If you're um, wandering about in Bloomsbury and you walk past the London School of Tropical Medicine, the name Far is emblazoned on the side of the building in his honour, um, which is, by the way. Um, my point being, I always understood that um, she ended up on the stage, but there was a bit before that, wasn't there? She missed out on having a living after her father died because the government wouldn't allocate his children a pension as they'd been expecting um her sister had already married off her brother was married off and so she was the one unmarried but i have read in places that she went to be a governess but that's the only thing i've heard literally and she didn't like it can you expand on any of that please because i've never <clears throat> i know that her father got uh, got dementia and mm. i so it may have been that he just faded from view to some extent, you know, because yeah. there was just one daughter left and there was a bit of money left that it, it was sort of, you know, they presumed that they, the family would be okay. Um, it, but I, I really haven't dug into that side of her. No, it seems to be, there's, we've got so much information about her life from the Golden Dawn on, what, what, yeah. She's been writing her theatrical activity, but there almost seems to be this sort of little hole. We mm -hmm. know more about Annie's journey because obviously her father had the Horniman Museum. They were all part of that. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just curious because, like I said, there is the in the biography about her, there is just this comment um, that she went to be a governess. Um I just kind of wondered how she would have got on with that, really. And the only reason I, I've i picked up on that fact is when she was imperata of the temple in London at Isis Urania, she would have been training and teaching. Yes, yes, yes. And also, you don't know, it, it's. I think the word governess is one of those things for nice middle-class ladies. Mm. You know, their status wasn't quite servant and it was, certainly wasn't family. It was a difficult one. But... Someone like her, she could have, you know, it could have been, her, didn't her sister marry a Paget? She could have yes. given singing, dancing, elocution, artistic lessons to their kids. And so she, you know, they gave her a few pounds for doing that. It well, could have been one of those things rather than being, uh, you know, a, a sort of a Jane Eyre type figure. Mm. I just can't see that fitting with her at all. No. Um, so I don't know. Good question, Lucy. Good Thank question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I do know that Florence ended up living with um, Henry and Etta, her sister, in Bedford Park. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, to me, is the most sort of important cluster of GD members when they all ended up flocking there for one reason or another. And that that actually was after her divorce that you mentioned, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's... Um... You know, she, but he seems to have been the classic ne'er do well. You know, he was young, he was handsome, he was a drinker, he was full of bright ideas, all the rest of it. And you can see that it, he would have captured that side of her very, very well indeed. But he, he just didn't want to grow up and grow out of that. She had much more no. wit about her, really, and to stay with him. No, I, I, yeah, I, I just, I don't know whether anybody's, if he appears in any of the American theatrical biographies. Oh. Because I've never taken much notice of him, but it, it's just possible because he came from a theatrical family. Yeah. Um, and so maybe she's mentioned in those, but it's, it's digging I haven't dug. So. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank Lovely you. to see you. I'll see you soon, I hope. Sending Bye. hugs from Cornwall. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, we have a, a wonderful question in the chat here from Rowena. Thank you very much, Rowena. And uh, the let's see. The question is: um, Ellen Terry semi-adopted the artist of R the Rider Waite Tarot, Pamela yeah. Coleman Smith. Do you yeah. know if she met with Florence Farr? And she says, "I have been trying to find out who introduced her to the Golden Dawn." Well, um, I don't know who, in, well, it, the theatrical connection and the artistic connection for Florrie Farr join, joining the GD is fairly understandable. Um, Waite took Pamela Coleman-Smith under his wing and saw that, spotted her as a talented young artist who could 
do the work that he wanted done. They, they, they um, he had the sense to direct her through the, the 22 majors and then leave her to have her own head on the other 56, which is why they're so splendid, I think. Um, but Ellen Terry was absolutely marvellous in many ways. I simply adore the woman. She was, she was like the Judy Dench of her time. Everybody loved her. And she got married to an artist, Watts, when she was 16. She'd had, she got fed up with him. So, because her mother, his mother was weird, I tell you. And then she had two kids out of wedlock. And she worked with um, Henry Irving, who was the first actor to be knighted um, at the Lyceum from in uh, the West End for many, many, many years. And his manager was um, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. And if you look at the Lyceum walls, it has Irving Stoker Terry on it. And um, she, she she was just warm, motherly, fantastic. She came from a theatrical family. She was, she was very rich and she had lots and lots and lots of people in her entourage. But what kept Pamela closer to her, I think, is that she was, <clears throat> excuse me, she came from an affluent, creative, artistic, business-like American family. And but she was the age of Ellen Terry's daughter, who um, Edie, who lived in a, a, a lesbian menage a trois down in Kent together. And Pamela Coleman Smith was one of their great friends. And then what what made and made her drift away was that she became a Catholic. Um, and she was also here, there, and everywhere all the time. She wasn't particularly a sticker at things. Um, and it would be because the esoteric world was a small world then, it's not, you know, and it was all centered around London. Um, then it would have been easy for her to meet yet yeah, yeah, wait and um you know, through that just sort of friendship groups, really. I haven't got a, a, a definite who it was, but it would have been someone around and about in, in the group because you don't have to belong to the same thing to know loads of other people who have similar interests. Um, but, you know, she 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 was great, but Ellen Terry was simply marvellous. And I um, have a, uh, we have a, a tarot exhibition here at the moment with the first ever article and the first ever images of the weight deck in that, written by weight. And we also have photographs of Ellen Terry holding her white Pomeranians, which she loved and have changed quite a bit from the Poms that you see these days. But I like to think that the fool's dog in the weight deck, the PCS deck, is based on one of Ellen Terry's dogs. So um, compare and contrast, they, it works for me, <laughs> so yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, I'd like to ask you, please. Uh, first of all, right at the beginning of your talk, you read some extraordinary passage. I don't know what that was from, um, describing the role of women or the the, uh, the supposed role of women. Yeah. And uh, I was I was really uh, um, taken aback by that. It's quite extreme, really. Um, and it just goes to to show how radical these ladies were. Yeah. in in the work that they were doing and the stance that they took not only in terms of their uh, magical explorations but also within society and the role of women in society and yeah. um, the contribution of women in society and um, I'm curious as to uh, what your thoughts are on on the following so at that same time they were very much activists uh, with, within society and would have been swimming against the tide, against the current. Um, but because of the fact they were, they began to work with those uh, Egyptian rites, they were um, evoking and invoking uh, very powerful and potent forces, mm. um, which then were granted um, a conduit, if you like, to begin to express those energies in the world at large. What do you, um, what what are your thoughts or feelings about the potential influence uh, upon the development of society as a result of the actual magical work that those women did? Oh, that's a bold question, isn't it? Because I tend to like to think that 
they were very sensible and they kept their magic within the temple. But the, so it didn't bleed into the rest of their lives because it was first generation doing ritual in living memory in some ways, doing proper rit ritual magic again. But the wideness of their reading and the, the, um, the different sorts of people that they knew, their conversations must have been quite amazing. Um, but also, people that they these people did it in public. You know, they made no they they were on the stage. They were directing things. They were financing things. They they were voices within groups. They as I say, they were suffragists, suffragettes as well. They they used their skills wherever they could, and so but that magical side of them gave also gave them a great confidence and a great structure to what they they thought they were doing but i i, I think that they they kept the the socialist side of them if you like because a lot of them were liberal socialists they that was separate to the egyptian gods who you could they were trying to change society you wouldn't dare try to change an egyptian god so i think that they probably just kept that very much in a box, but it was the heartbeat of their lives, really. And it is quite fascinating to think about magical thinking, creativity, activism. That's a it's a very potent energy. Yeah. And and the the you know if you you know I mean you look at you know if you look at society now the current state of you know what creativity is and and, mm. and how you know if you talk about these very powerful women who were writing plays putting on plays you know decorating them mm. acting in them whilst also you know i mean bedford park is also a fascinating uh concept when you think about what they're all living together they yep. all i mean you know, that's a really really powerful uh conduit for creativity yeah and, and with with a with that sort of magical essence as well it's and you kind of think about it like what would be the equivalent now I and mean, where is where where is that creative that, that that mixture of creativity and magical thinking in today's society if you think about it, it was you know if you look back now i mean it was so uh there was a, it was, it was a, such a creative point sort of uh politically yeah. and creatively it's you know that's yeah that combination now is, I think, a very rare thing. I think it's on TikTok, but it's individuals doing yeah. it. You know, there's no collaboration in mm. those ways, except with one or two people. I think that was the that was the, the magical essence. But that's what do you think? That's where the collaboration, the collaborating in the temple, yes. which then led to more creative collaboration outside. Of the oh, temple. I do, I do, and I also think that you know it was more. In a way, Bedford Park and places like that, they were more like the 60s squats, mm. communes, sharingness. Mm. You know, they, they swapped dresses, they, you know, they laughed, cried, got drunk like everybody else. But there, there was the, sh the society shared in those ways. We've become very individualized. But there's an enormous amount of young people who are sort of post the Harry Potter generation, who are now sort of 35, 40 ish who have just absolutely, I mean, from 40 downwards, I would say, that people absolutely accept that magic and tarot are parts of their lives, that all things are possible now. That is one of the great world shifts that, you know, J.K. Rowling made the world literate and it also made it just accept magic is a thing and magic is doable. And the most, you know, looking through our customers, the most unexpected people in a way, know about tarot you know it's through all the generations it's through all the classes it's all through all the subsets if you like and um magic the, the empowerment that it gives you you know um you know by being a druid or whatever you are that and that feeling of fellowship every people realize that they need that mm. yeah and they have different tribes is it a case of um in their lives and who they were is it a case of does a pebble know that it makes ripples? I think this lot certainly wanted to, because they use their voices. Because if they're a pebble and they're interacting with these forces and they're thrown, they become a vehicle. Mm. Are they aware of the ripples? Potentially, they're just who they are, and everything else 
everything else as a consequence of all their interactions in their life, just like simply the ripples. Yeah. They affect everything else. Well, uh, so I think because there was a public face to a lot of these women, that they really did know what they were doing. And more so than the men, oddly enough. You know, Crowley's a notable example. Uh, Alan Bennett died too young. But Mathers published, various of them published. You know, Waite did the more Christian uh, mystical side of things, but he got it out there, and he got a lot of it out there as well. They they used their, their, their passion to spread the word for what they were doing. It seems that they're a lot more effective. Long enduring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're modernists, you see. They they it, they got rid of the these and the thous. They they made it acceptable to the current ear. They could put my cab younger generation are doing when they're no longer he's and she's, they're they's and yes, theirs and 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 they've thrown back everything that sort of we're <laughs> we're hanging on to. And, yeah, um, for them. They're getting by on solidarity, really, but solidarity with everyone because they can beat anyone. Yes. And they'll accept anyone. And yeah. in the face of everything that's going on, they're sort of coming together in communities, which is what Bedford Square would have been, which is what the homeschooling networks are and the student encampments are. And they're sort of these all coming together. Yeah. And, and Bedford Park wasn't, I mean, a middle class enclave by any manner of means back then. No, it was, it was a modern housing estate where you could choose the gable ends and the fireplaces and the style of windows and everything you wanted from a catalogue. It was a speculative building. Charity. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things uh, the Golden Dawn was, I believe, was a new Rosicrucian movement of its time. Yeah. But magical. Yeah. Would you agree? I would. And so... The newness and the uh, place for this order was very much a Victorian creation mm -hmm. based on incredible historical and some of the most um, iconic god forms, yeah, which they invoked and evoked yeah yeah <laughs> not sure about that um and the result was a hundred years later we're still talking about it yeah and i must say what you described the people and what was behind it uh, as someone who's not really been involved in, in the gold door before was really really interesting uh, it's truly inspired me in what you said and, and the talk you've given. So well, thank, thank, you thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll do one on the men next time. You'll be blown away by them as well. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the question I had was really, and I don't want to to tread on Alex's comments that he just made about the sort of um, art-related spiritual aspects of these people. But I know I can ask you, as someone who has been involved in this kind of thing, do you think this group of people became inspired and inspired each other to then go and be more creative, which is what they seem to be, very creative people? Mm. Yeah, I do. I think they absolutely supported each other. I really, really do. And I was thinking even of Florence Farr, you know, as a young actress trying to make her name, to decide to be an actress for, in an Ibsen play, she was putting herself out there as radical. She could have, you know, said, said no, thank you. I'll just build my name and somebody else can take it on. They had the courage to do it, but they, 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 they had the support of each other. And some of the audiences for, for Shaw's and, and Yeats's first place, they booed them off the stage. Yeah, you know, absolutely scandalous, but they, they supported each other, yes. And the thing I'm trying to get to mm -hmm. is do you think it was the strength and the um, talking to a group of smaller people mm -hmm. who they were uh, inspired by 
gave them the confidence to be better actresses, better actors, better poets. I'm, I'm trying to get to what is it? They yeah. had what was what they, they had their motivations for then doing what they did, without a doubt, and that gave them the courage to do it. And I'm sure that they would have do, done small rituals before they set off to do anything so that they were primed and ready to go. So in, in can you imagine a situation where these people have done this communally jointly in the golden door mm. and then taken that to their work class, if you like, yeah. and thought about what they're going to do next. Yeah. Inspired with a rod of iron, if you like, um, and just gave them the confidence to do spectacular things. Yeah, all of them. Oh yeah, I mean, even simple things like you know, knowing that every day of the week has a planet ascribed to it. You know, so Monday is the Moon Day. So so you, and so it's white foods, it's white clothes, it's white is and uh, slightly shimmery things even is to do with the Moon, but it's also about the emotions. So if you've got to go to the dentist, which is white teeth, but you're very scared of doing it, make the appointment on Monday, but make it for Friday, which is the day of Venus, which is the day of love. So it's a gentler experience. A lovely dental appointment. Right? right? <laughs> but so right. it's it's using magic in those practical ways, as people still do. But just just imagine if they, you know, they say three, two or three of the women I've talked about today decided to do something to make something successful. Yes, that's where I'm getting. They, they they doubtless would have done that, but it wouldn't have been a full GD thing. It would have been they would have created a ritual to make it work. So within this natural magic that's going on, they learned the power of natural magic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as in. Position the horoscope, colours to choose, as colours not to choose yeah. for that day. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When to do an operation mm. and when not to do it. Yeah. So these are other things that they learn through the process and the natural magic of the golden door. Yeah. yeah. But also, if you think about the Egyptian stuff, Egypt uh, um, archaeology was only given a name in about 1850. Within 35 years, they're doing full-blown Egyptian rituals. Now, they'd gone to um, archaeology being set up to try and prove the Bible right, which is why they'd gone to the Holy Lands and around and about, and also having defeated Napoleon, you know, early 1814, 15, 16, whatever it was, when they shot the, the nose off the Sphinx and stuff. They were very aware of it. The... Early Egyptologists were absolute bandits, um, absolutely thieves. disgraceful people, thieves, blatant thieves. They were shockers, absolute shockers. But that suddenly, they haven't got much information to work on. It's very newly brought back, and they're pouring over it at the Egyptian Ex Exploration Society and various things like that. And they're deciding to bring these god forms to life. What an odd thought and what a bold thought. And having decided that, how the hell do you do it? As you say, you can imagine them doing the first operation thinking, what the hell is going to happen? Here? Yeah. And a head-banging art student, female. Oh, yeah, she'll do. <laughs> but she obviously really, really, really yeah, wanted yeah. to as well because they would have thought that the feminine side would have been a moderating force. If they unleashed something, then they could have closed it down, but she was less likely to be attacked, that there's there would have been a, a respect for the feminine. So, uh, did did we want to... I'm sorry, but it's something that relates to something that happened recently. The vulnerability of women, Yes, which we discussed as a superpower of women, there alleged weakness which is vulnerability uh, did that make them more receptive to these god egyptian god forms than perhaps the men i think the psychism did yeah and back then more so than now a lot of men would have been good at order and structure yeah and also the, the three 
chiefs, you know, Mathers, Woodman and Wesker, they were very used to ritual. These other people, were, you know, Mathers was older than Mina and, you know, by 10, 12 years, something like that. So his life experience had been quite different as well. And then the, these women coming in were young. But and so, the, so the, the compl- they were complementary as a team, basically. I think the greatest difference, or to me, the most significant difference is there was a place for the feminine in their rituals, full stop. I mean, yeah. an actual real place for women to aspire to and to be the leaders yeah. in that space, more so than probably in anything else I've come across. Yeah. But also they, they'd had the shining example of Blavatsky heading the Theosophical Society, which became extraordinarily popular. Two things if I may. First of all, just to say that our uh, my craft lodge, which was formed by um, Italian catering people, wait, waiters and catering back in the 19th century, works in Italian. Um, we have, because you mentioned Madame Blavatsky, at our festive boards, we have carried my sword on the top table. I can see that. Yeah, we could arrange that. It's, 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 it's in a glass case. Sorry. The lodge table. Yeah. It's in a glass case and it's it's revered. It's um we could get uh, Blavatsky's blood off it and we could clone her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, my my um my Welsh grandmother, who I was very close to, was born in the same area of North Wales and at a similar time as the Fortune. Mm-hmm. When I was about I think I, I it was a couple of years before I went to the grammar school, so it must have been eight or nine or something. And in our primary school, there was an epidemic explosion of warts. And huh? after that, all of us, we had warts all over our hands. Really terrible. And um, my mother took me to the doctor, who prescribed creams, got most of them, and, but nothing worked. Now, my grandmother, I was very close to my grandmother, for the whole of my life, until she passed. Huh? And um, she, she seemed to believe that there was nothing that either a poultice or one of the brews she made from the flowers and herbs in the garden could cure. Mm. She, anyway, when, uh, the, 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 the warts didn't go away. The whole, the whole class seemed to have the whole year. And she called me into her study one day um, and told me to do something, which I now look back and realise it was a magical spell. Mm-hmm. But how do you really attach it? I can't say what that was. So I, because I trusted it completely, I did this religiously. I had to do it at a certain time of the night, mm-hmm. very precise. And I carried out this this operation, and um, I was the only one in the school. Within like three or four days, the walks had all gone. Oh. So I, I always see that now as done as my first initiation. Yeah, it set me on a path for thinking about things. The, the point of the story is that I will. I have no idea way of knowing if she knew the unfortunate, but she lived close by. It. Similar, I'll say similar really. I would love to be able to find out. I wonder if there's any way I could research that to see if there was some kind of group that existed in the land of no area. Um, there's been a book out by Troy Books, which is Welsh witchcraft. It's more likely to be in there. Troy Books. Troy Books, yeah. Um, it's more likely to be in there than in Dion Fortune because her family didn't stay there. They moved around right. a bit. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, they they were vegetarians and things like that. They they ran a vegetarian wholesale business and stuff. They were and then theosophists and they were a very interesting family. My and, and also, brother's family was in the wholesale food business. Huh. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. The gypsy cure for warts is to rub potato on. All right. Cut a potato in half. Yeah. Rub it on the wart. Bury the potato with the potato. I can't comment. Yeah. So, I, what, did you use potatoes in that part of that? Really? I did actually use potatoes, but I can't comment. I, I only really touch it. It's not something. I like. used to buy them off people for 10p. Not potatoes. So potatoes they were the warts. The warts. <laughs> so they weren't theirs anymore. And they, they, that was very successful for a lot of people. It, it, it's, a, it's an infection inside you. So I think yeah. you can treat it your mind. And, uh, yeah. My daughter grew a great big wart from on her top lip and just kept growing out as they did. Oh, oh yes, yes. We rubbed the potato on it. It's gone in days. It's fabulous. Yeah. But it could have been her mind rather than the actual action. But yeah. it's a gypsy, there's a fabulous gypsy um, book, mm-hmm. Magic. Yes. Found in 
High Council Library in Scotland. Yeah. It's the only one you can use that I've. Yeah, but it, it, it works. <laughs> it works. Yeah. yeah. Banana skins as well. All right. The Baruch is in Watts, banana skin, and the other one's Black Seagull. All right. Uh, Geraldine, yeah. Geraldine, um, we have a comment from a gentleman called Joe in the chat. And uh, he says, this is a comment rather than a question. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Geraldine. Your passion for the top topic is clear. Your profound, uh, almost personal knowledge of these people shines through. Near the beginning of the talk, you said that women's dignity had to go out of the window as a result, and then in brackets, or maybe a prerequisite of joining the GD. And then he says, I would argue that the content of your talk demonstrates that their dignity remained intact under incredibly difficult circumstances. Bravo to them and to you for sharing their stories. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that. I really do. Yes. It's kind. Thank you. Is there anybody else who has any questions uh, who are joining us online rather than the people at the Atlantis bookstore? Any questions? Otherwise, if there are people there with you, Geraldine, um, back to back to you guys. Yeah. Okay. Any more for any more? Anyone? Well, I was curious. You mentioned Heather Garber and how she was that the play was influential. Yes. Just a bit, if you could elaborate a bit more on that, because uh, that I found very interesting. Uh, basically, Ibsen wrote every one of his plays is the same play to some extent, and it's a you know. Um, it's about a woman who decides not to do what is expected of her. And I want to have a lover and I want you to love me as well, husband, you know, that sort of thing. And it, it, I can't remember the plot of it nearly in, enough, but like in Rosmersholm, Rosmersholm, the uh, the servants want some of what the rich people have got. And the women want what the, the women, the rich women have got as well. It's 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 about a leveling up to that extent, it's never going to kind of happen, but there's a great desire for it. it, it they're, they're all fascinating. They're, and there's, there's, it's, been, it's been produced a million times. So it's, it's all findable. It's really interesting because that was my first exposure to drama. Mm -hmm. So uh, Head the Garble and the Caucasian Chalk Circle, oh, yes. like the, the, the same author. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's really interesting that you mentioned that. And I found it as well at the time quite mind expansive and quite feminist. Yeah. Yeah. Quite empowering. Yeah. 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 I mean, at the moment, the swing seems to be very much the other way. The poor men can't get a look into anything. You know, and I don't think that's funny, really. You know, it's it's too harsh. It's it's not it's too simplistic. And um, I was talking to somebody who hires and fires people quite a lot, and he was saying that his bosses have decided he can only employ women. And I said, Yeah, but women are cheaper. And he said, Oh no, we don't know that they are cheaper. Even now, no. So, so very cynical. Shouldn't be. Yeah. No, 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 no. You know, an equal pay for an equal day's work, basically. I have a comment, please, or uh, maybe a question for you. Um, at the uh, in the early founding days of the GD, as you mentioned, um, there was a. A collaboration, wonderful collaboration between these early priestesses and the resurgence or re-emergence of the priestesses uh, with um, very experienced Freemasons mm. who had their understanding of ritual and, if you like, the, the, the more um, earthly uh, expression or the form of things in, in, in terms of ritual and ceremony. Um, and that collaboration was really quite revolutionary at the time. And um, what, right at the end of your talk, you said something that really uh, struck a chord for me. And that was uh, now, of course, it's up to us. Um, meaning that those, those women were, who were pioneers then, they kind of set a precedent, really. They, they raised the bar and... Mm. Uh, um, so I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are regarding um, uh, the, the possibilities of um, mutual cooperation and um, collaboration 
between different spiritual orders at this point in in human history? I think there is, and I think there there should be, and I think there always has been. Yeah, you know, um, if you've got like minded people, then it doesn't matter quite what you call yourselves to that extent you've got common cause you've got a reason mm. for working together and you know we, we've been fortunate to grow up in a, a, until recently a very liberal society and we're not so bothered by the the barriers that used to be there and I really very much hope they that they don't go up again you know it's easy to compartmentalize people because you can control them box by box by box if you've got this sort of spider's web of people coming at it at the same thing from different angles. It's much more creative. It's much more fruitful. It's much more positive. And, and it, it has a, a dynamism, but it has a strength to it as well. And also what's been ignored is the magical abilities of the men who were in the golden dawn, you know, the, the um, Bob Gilbert's um, biographies and uh you know, the various very good structural work that he did, Alec Howe did, all the rest of it, it doesn't say what those men's talents were. And it's not that they left it to the women to be psychic or to um, be good at drawing things or whatever it was. Somehow that's become known about them much more. But they would be they were learning, they were being taught as well. So who who was doing all of that? You know, I think that Hockley was a generation before even Westcott, but he would have been aware of him, you know, because you couldn't not have been. But Hockley's great thing, as well as being a great ritualist and a sweet man and all the rest of it, was his scrying. And the many years that he spent doing that. So that was a given, I would have thought, when they set up the GD, that you would work on that level. I'm sorry to interrupt but the thing that we both know about Hockley is that he didn't do the scrying. No. He always had uh, mediums, and he was just the person who wrote yeah. down yeah. what the scrying person said. Yeah, but it was a thing. Like, no, 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 I just to correct you on that, yeah, because yeah. you and I know that's okay. an important part of it. Yeah, no, no, he, he couldn't do it. I mean, he, you know, he, like John D, was as psychic as a doorknob, but he had the questions, you know, and it's it, important. It, yeah. it was the women that were doing the scrying. Yeah. They needed somebody yeah. to write down what they said. Yeah. And I believe it's not possible to be a medium and write down the same things. Oh, no, they can't, and they can't do it at the same time. No, no, no not really. And they should do automatic writing. So, yes, but they, but they, they, they certainly had an, an appreciation of denizens of other worlds being accessible. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. He was doing it first. Yeah. Um, but the Golden Dawn wasn't necessarily all about that. But oh, no. the relationship between women who were probably more connected mm. and the men were benefiting by hearing. Yeah. And probably had probably uh, does the does the medium then need to be told what, what she said because they they, they can't necessarily don't remember. remember. Don't no, they remember. Don't... No, no, no. Oh. No. Well, so you could see that dynamic working in the Golden Dawn amongst those people who did that, because that was mm. the later development, probably with the Stella Matatina, mm. where they went more into that whole area of, and there's that fabulous tract, isn't there, of um, connections, talking about what what mediums, if we call mm. them, mediums yeah. were were getting and they would always need someone to write it down for them. So there was that yeah. dual, dual purpose there. And also that would have been one aspect of the rituals they were doing. You know, the, the GD is a, is a very rigorous magical training, basically. And I also think it's quite formidable when, you know, groups do something in unison. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it's very thrilling there is a potency to that you know you can you can feel it from kind of like a church a temple yeah absolutely you know, yes yes when yes you're like -minded people the football the crowd thing, the yeah football it's crowd. wonderful it's massive you know? yeah we've all felt it um and you're feeling it about a certain thing at the same time which is powerful yeah and that's what we're all talking about here. yeah uh, geraldine may i take this a little further please so um as you as you were just saying then um the influence of groups working together it has a great potency 
And um, uh, do you do you have any knowledge of um, the the work that was being done during the Second World War um, with collaborations of uh, um, people involved in different spiritual orders in order to uh, harness and increase the amount of light in the world during a very dark period in our history? Well, I know that when we went to war in Iran, there were lots of groups who didn't shout about it, but they did a lot of work to protect this nation and to lessen the effects everywhere of that war for the people directly involved, but to keep our shores safe. And I couldn't collate those groups now. I couldn't have done it then. And it was just a fact of what people did. And the witches did do, they, they, you know, there's the long held fable of the, at the time of the Armada, the witches worked to repel the Armada. And during the Second World War, they worked to repel Hitler. And when you stand on that south coast and you can see France and you realise how blooming close it was, you can see absolutely everybody would have put whatever they could into it. Again, the legend has that, you know, a couple of people died. They were old. They were ill. It wasn't good weather, you know, and they they were not knowingly sacrificing themselves, but they got pneumonia and they died. But it was, you know, the, the, you know, pneumonia was an old man's disease back then. It could have taken off from any of them that winter anyway. Um, but here we have Dion Fortune's crystal ball, and we also have a crystal ball which was owned by somebody who took part in that rite. Um, I have, we have no idea of their name. Their grandson came in and said, the family doesn't want this. It's just family talk to us. We're not bothered. Do you want it? And so I keep them looking at each other to that extent. Um, we would never, ever use either of them. Um, but it makes perfect sense that everybody did. And, and, you know, churches prayed for peace, you know, and also the, the, the esoteric movement was far smaller back then. But I think people, you know, anybody with any common decency would have done whatever they could to keep things away. But how we list them, goodness only knows. I suppose that's where you had the um, minute silence set up. And I did quite a bit of work on the guy who did that. He was a... Um, no, I'm in danger of getting him confused with somebody else. But he was very, you know, that was a very important thing. That that was a great unifier around the world. So, and it's hardly a straight fiction thing to do. Um, I understand that that silent minute still happens. Uh, there does, are many yes. people around the world observing that at 9 p.m. Yeah. every evening. Yeah, yeah, important. Does anybody else there at Atlantis Bookstore have anything they'd like to contribute? Please go ahead if you do. Not here, Shane. I think we've had plenty. In this Fantastic. Room. Okay, then. Uh, is there anybody else joining us online who would like to uh, communicate anything, ask any questions or observations or comments? Please go ahead wherever you are in the world. Okay, Geraldine, it looks like we may have reached a natural conclusion uh, for our meeting. And I'm just going to change the view on the screen here for the purpose of the recording so we can see everybody. And um, yeah, Geraldine, thank you so much. On behalf of the Metropolitan Study Group of the SRIA, um, that's a fantastic presentation. And um, I, we, we really do look forward to you speaking again in the future. Uh, I'm sure whatever the subject matter may be, it's always a, um, a, a wonderful in, and uh, very enlightening and educational and uh, wonderfully fun thing when you present as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much personally as well from me. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, yeah, you have thank yous in the chat as well from everybody here. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, from wherever you are in the world today. And it's lovely to see you. And we look forward to seeing you next month, third Saturday in June.
for our next meeting. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And uh, Geraldine and everyone at the Atlantis Bookstore, have wonderful conversations and a wonderful rest of your evening. Lots Thank of love you. to you all. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.